don't do any good, so let's just keep going. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for our church, and we thank you for the opportunity to learn about sharing our faith in you. So bless this time and these subsequent lessons as they unfold, and I would pray for myself and for Bruce as we lead, and that you would use your Holy Spirit to guide us. Uh, we pray this in your name. Amen. So the I was hoping everybody would sit over here to kind of get that mindset, but anyway, um, if, I'm not going to make you move if you want to sit on that side, if that's what you want to do. But um, at least next week, maybe, if you want to sit over here, that would be great. Um, I want to start this morning by asking a question, and uh, I am not trying to embarrass you in any way. I'm not trying to belittle you in any way, but I want to see a show of hands if you in your life have ever led someone to Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, that would be probably very, very typical in any congregation that we would go into this morning and ask that question. If you saw the bulletin and read that face-sharing section, uh, about 95% of the church says that they have never, ever in their life, led anyone to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So you don't need to feel like, okay, wow. But I do feel like that um, this is the challenge to the church today because I believe that needs to change. Uh, I firmly believe, as I've been praying and studying for uh, these lessons, that God has impressed upon me that I have failed as your pastor because we've waited too late, too long, put this off too long. Um, and you'll see why I will say that in just a few minutes um, when we actually look at uh, some principles. But um, we're going to change that. Um, the session, actually it was your session in October that um, challenged me when the question arose as I was challenging them, but I don't know how to do that. And I said, hmm, okay, God, and my heart kind of, you know, whoo, you know, here I'm supposed to be the shepherd and the pastor and, the, uh, and to be that person that helps to equip you as laity uh, to live out your faith. That's part of my responsibility, and I have failed in that. And so, um, subsequently, as we began to talk uh, the rest of that weekend uh, at our session retreat, I said, we're going to change that because I'm going to offer the class, and then it's going to be, um, Terry said, you might want, not want to say that, but you know me, I stick my foot in my mouth enough, it's okay. Y'all are gracious often to forgive me. Um, but, you know, if somebody that's not here and doesn't take this class and they come up to me in six or eight months and say, well, I don't know how to share my faith, nobody's taught me, I'm going to look at them and say, you had the opportunity. Okay, this is, this is on, if, if you're not here, you can look at the streaming. Al is, is uh, uh, taping this and it'll be up uh, this week. So I believe it's important. I also believe, as I have prayed and studied about this, is that God's going to do a work through this. I actually believe that because you are sitting here and you are willing to be instructed um, by Elder Bruce Mack and myself in sharing your faith, faith sharing, um, that God is going to do a work. I believe that God is going to help to grow our congregation as a result of what you are doing. And that is, I want to further myself so that I know how to share my faith. So I want to stop there first um, to say, I intentionally named this class, titled this class, Faith Sharing. I didn't say, come learn how to win someone to Christ. Now, are you going to learn how to do that, how uh, to handle objections through this course that I would call it, uh, this class? Yes, but faith sharing is much, much more than that. Faith sharing may be that God is going to use you to bring someone back to him that has fallen away. 
faith sharing is also discipleship. We are called to help people be healthy in their faith. That is faith sharing. And so it, I want you to understand it's just not only we're only going to teach what it means to bring someone to Jesus Christ. So today I want to do a little bit of background of um, the early church and what it means and what our call is to faith sharing, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, what it means to um, understand what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to teach today and next week, and then on the 26th, Bruce is going to pick up, and we haven't planned out February yet, but um, uh, he and I both will preach during, or teach during that month, uh, probably a little bit of preaching too. Um, so um, neither one of us can stand up and talk without um, preaching, it seems like. The uh, materials, if you wanted to purchase uh, some materials, you can. And I will tell you, they're very inexpensive. You can go to Amazon and get this book. Uh, this is Evangelism Explosion by D. James Kennedy. It's the fourth edition. That's the one you need to get. And this book is uh, $10.25, so not very expensive. Uh, the other book that we'll be using um, is this book. And it's called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And this is by Ross <coughs> Coleman. This is the second edition. And this book will cost you about $6.25 on Amazon. And I didn't add in the shipping. If you're a Prime member, you got free shipping anyway. Um, there is a, um, a complimentary book to this initial book that Robert um, Coleman wrote called uh, Master Plan of Evangelism um, that gives uh, some understanding and application uh, that we'll use also. But these two books, if you wanted to purchase them, uh, would be, I would say, a good part in your library uh, to have. Um, so I don't know how long the class, I don't know how many sessions we'll have. Um, and Bruce and I were texting back and forth this week, and um, I told him, I said, we'll probably go kind of slow at this. And he said, I think that's probably a good thing. Why rush it? Just let the Holy Spirit lead. And um, we certainly want time for question and answer. We'll do uh, down the road a little bit. We'll do some role play. Um, and um, so let me back up from that. And so um, those are things that we will invite you to be a part of. Um, so that you can actually get some experience. Um, we'll ask a couple of you and help you go through and give you a script so that others can see what it is to share faith. And then um, we'll do some difficult classes where uh, we'll have some hard questions thrown back at that person so that we kind of see, okay, what happens when uh, someone throws a question at you that you say, oh, what I do about that one? So um, I hope it will be interesting. I hope you'll get a lot out of it. So um, there is a acronym that we're going to refer to throughout this study. Many of you have seen this before, and there's variations of it. Uh, there's uh, one that has an extra F. There's one that has a K on the end. And so, but we're going to use for our instruction purposes this acronym. acronym. So if you're a note taker, you'll want to take it down. It's FRIEND, Friends, Relatives, Acquaintances, and Neighbors. So I said there's an extra F, some put another F in front for family, some used Frank and put a K at the end for kids, and so, you know, you can write those down if you want to, but we're going to look at uh, these relationships uh, that take place between our friends, our relatives, our acquaintances, and our neighbors. There are four uh, phases that we're going to go through during this, this course. And so uh, we'll talk about relationships over the next few weeks. What does those relationships look like? How do you cultivate them? 
The evangelism phase is where you're actually going to share your faith, either with a non-Christian or a Christian that's fallen away. And so we will help you understand um, and hopefully um, learn how to productively share your faith. And then uh, the third phase is that of discipleship. Too often, and, and you please hear me, Billy Graham had absolutely a wonderful ministry. And so many looked at Billy Graham and said, we have all of these people that come down to, uh, at his um, um, revivals and they come front and give their life to Christ. Who in the world is shepherding them? Billy actually, he, he understood what it meant when somebody came to Christ that there was more to it than that. And so he did have churches. He had people in place to help to disciple those that gave their life at his revivals. And it's important for us that when we either lead someone back to Christ that have turned their back or a new convert to Christ, when Christ uses us to do that, the Holy Spirit uses us to do that, that you can't just move on and just leave them out there to flounder, especially if it's a new Christian. Because they need to be enveloped into the body of Christ. They need to be helped and discipled. And then you go to the fourth, which is a healthy growth pattern. In other words, um, you get them to a point that they are healthy, and ultimately then it replicates. So that this person that you have, by Christ, Holy Spirit, helped to come into relationship with Christ, they are discipled and growing um, uh, faithfully in their walk. They, in turn, replicate what God has used you for. That's how the church will grow. And so these are the, um, the phases that, that we will get into as we move along over the next few weeks. And so this morning, I want to do a little bit as far as getting back to um, <clears throat> the understanding of what we are called to do, some biblical principles, some foundational pieces um, this morning. So someone that has a, a Bible, raise your hand that wants to read. So I've saw, okay, so Diane and Bruce. Um, Bruce, look up Acts 26, 14 through 18, and Diane, look up Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, the Matthew text most of you are familiar with. Uh, it's called the Great Commission. Uh, most of you can probably recite it by um, without even looking it up. I don't know that any of you can recite Acts 26, 14, and 8 through 18. Uh, maybe. That would be great, but I'm not sure you can. <laughs> You'll hear it in just a minute. Um, let's do the uh, Acts text first. Acts 26, 14 through 18. 14 through 18. And when, he, and when he had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goat. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, <clears throat> rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the domination of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Okay. And then the Matthew text. Now I'll go back to Acts in just a second. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In the Acts text, this is Paul that is recanting what happened to him on the road to Damascus. You know the story of Paul. I'm not going to sit and 
teach or preach about Paul, but I do want to give a synopsis. So you know that he was persecuting um, the Christians. Um, uh, you know about Stephen who was stoned. Uh, that was one of the things that Paul really, it, it weighed upon him, uh, the fact that um, he was not one casting a stone, but he was certainly one um, that condoned uh, Stephen's stoning. Um, and here he is recanting what the Lord said to him. And the Lord said to him that I have set you apart to go and preach the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles so that they may know, and I'm giving you a paraphrase, uh, of who I am and what I have done uh, <clears throat> through uh, the life and death and resurrection um, of me. Jesus is talking, you know, Paul is saying Jesus is talking to him about doing this. And so uh, there is a call to Paul to share the gospel. The very first instructions that Jesus gave at the beginning of his ministry was this, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. Who was he talking to? The disciples. It was the call to the disciples to come. These lay witnesses as they would be and become ultimately as they carried out this message that God had, Jesus had laid upon them. So Jesus began his ministry with an instruction, come and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. I'm going to make you be able to share a, a, a good news that will bring people into relationship. In other words, he is talking about witnessing. His last instructions on earth are not only found in uh, Matthew 28, which we call the Great Commission. When Jesus was ready to ascend in Acts 1, he says, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea, all Samaria, up to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so he not only began his ministry with this understanding of becoming fishers of men, sharing the good news, but he ended his, I mean, right at the ascension, he ended his work with saying, you are to be fishers of men. You are to share this gospel of Jesus Christ, witnesses. And so that was his thrust. Certainly it had to be an important thrust for the Lord to say, this is what I want you to do, beginning and end. So, what has happened in the meantime from the first century to today? I want to walk through with that a little bit with you to give you understanding of where we're at today. And so this call to be disciples, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and then in turn to share your faith, to uh, be witnesses, be fishers of men and women, uh, was absolutely the call of all who came to faith in Jesus Christ but the devil stepped in. The devil stepped in. The whales of the devil. Um, he has strategic plans, and he was able to exercise those plans very accurately, very strategically as the church began. So here's let me give you an analogy before I give you exactly what I believe Satan was doing. And that is, let's look at it this way. Let's say someone has, um, is promoting that if everyone, all of our military, everyone would just go home and just let the generals fight the war, then everything would be good. It sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? But let's say the propaganda was such that you go home, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to fight. We've got our leadership in place, and they have the ability to handle it all. Sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? That's exactly what Satan did with the church. What Satan did with the church was to say, hey, You've got those pastors, you've got those who have been to seminary, you have gotten those that's got theological education, just let them handle it. 
you laity, don't worry about it. You really don't have the expertise to do anything. So you just come and sit in the pew. You just go and live your life. Let those who have the expertise in handling witnessing handle it. And that's exactly what the church did after 300 A.D. So in the first century, we know that the church scattered. The early church, uh, let me read for you Acts 8, 1 through 4. Saul was heartily agreement in hardly agreement with putting him to death talking about you know Stephen but then listen to what Luke tells us on the day of the great persecution began in the church in Jerusalem and they all scattered throughout the region of Judea Samaria except and I'm going to stop there I don't want you to know what the next word is so they scattered and they began to share their faith in all of these different regions. And the church began to explode. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Those were the apostles that scattered, right? Those apostles that were with Jesus Christ, they're the one that had the expertise. They were the ones that followed Jesus. They were the one taught by Jesus. And so they're the ones that went out. Well, see, you got to read one more word in this passage. And it says, except the apostles. So who scattered? The believers. The believers that were being persecuted, all of you had been in Jerusalem, and the persecution of Stephen and the persecution of Christians are happening, and you begin to scatter throughout the regions. Exactly what God said through Jesus Christ was going to happen. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the remotest parts of the earth. And so the laity began to scatter, not the disciples. And they began to preach. And the church began to expand. The church began to take off because people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. By the 300s, it was amazing what was taking place throughout all of the Roman Empire. The power of Christ had begun to just permeate everything. Rome itself was influenced. The Christian church was growing so rapidly by the second century, anywhere you went, you would find someone proclaiming the Christian faith. Anywhere in the known world. There were people, laity, out proclaiming the Christian faith. Constantine so knew that this was important <clears throat> that in 313, Constantine issued an edict of toleration. And in that edict, this is what he said, up until then, Christians could still be persecuted in the Roman government. But by 313, Constantine issued this edict of toleration, and what it said is, persecution has to stop against Christians. It has to stop. An interesting thing happened from that point. You've heard Dave Rendell say, when the church is persecuted, the church flourishes. Those first 313 years, back off, you know, about... 33 years um, or so, but those first 300 or so years of the church, the church was persecuted by um, those that, um, uh, false religions, those that uh, had no use for uh, Christianity or Christ. Uh, there were still Christians being put to death. And so the interesting thing is, is in the midst of the persecution, the church was flourishing. The church was growing rapidly in every way. And this edict of toleration was done. And that allowed so many of the barbarians, those who had superstitions, those who had heresies to infiltrate the church. And when they did, the church began to go astray. 
the church began to not share the gospel as they had before. And so this idea began to arise through this infiltration of people that did not know Christ. They were going into the church and saying, hey, that guy up there, um, he was educated by such and such. Uh, oh, he went to Duke or whatever. And so let him handle it. And people began to buy into it. In 200 years, just in 200 years from about 313 to 500, there was very little, very little lay witnessing taking place. The church looked at their pastors or leaders as the one that should be doing the job. It was let clerical George do it. Just let, you know, I'll come and listen. I'll be faithful because I'm a Christian and God's called me to come and worship him. But it's not my job. I don't have anything to do with that. And so the laity began to step back and step back and step back until the point that very little witnessing was taking place. Very little witnessing. In fact, it led to the Dark Ages. And really, it hasn't changed much since. You say, well, wait a minute, how about the Reformation and how about the explosion of the church in America during the revival times of the uh, 1800s? Yes, there were some highlights, some periods of time when the message of Jesus Christ went out, when there were those that were teaching and preaching this word of Christ. But for the most part, very little has changed since then. Evangelism, sharing your witness, has to be, has to be a way of life. You see, you can't, my, my job is this, I am to equip you. I am to uh, equip lay people in the way of evangelism. I am to, to be able to teach you and train you of how to go out. That's my responsibility. It is not my responsibility to be the only one to share Jesus Christ. And so when I say to you that I have failed you, it is the fact that this class comes 11 years into our existence. We started our 12th uh, day last Monday, actually last Sunday, because we started the church on the 4th of January of 19 or 2009. And so I want to apologize to you for that as the church. It is. It is. And so, as I was praying and thinking about it, this is what the, you say, wait a minute, the Lord talks to you? I, well, actually, he does. Um, I believe the Lord talks to me through his spirit as I stop and pray and listen. And so, this is what I believe the Lord is saying. Don't be too hard on yourself, because now's the time. We've waited. The church is ready. Now's the time for Hope Church to have an understanding of what it means to be lay witnesses for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now. So, the purpose of the minister is to train. To train to edify the body of Christ through the preaching of his word. You say, well, wait a minute. Now, I remember the Apostle Paul writing in the letter to the church at Ephesus, and there are some pastors, and there's some evangelists, and there's some, you know, that um, are teachers, and, and so on. And, and you are absolutely right. You are right. But the King James Version reads that way. But if you look at the Greek, this is a more literal translation 
of that text. And that would be Christ has given pastors and teachers to the church for the equipping of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the building of the body of Christ. So the correct translation, the literal translation is not for, but unto. This is the purpose of the pastors and the teachers that Paul talks about, that they are to train and equip. I am to train. Bruce is an elder in this church. He is to train and help equip you as laity in the sharing of the gospel. This is our responsibility. It's a revolutionary concept. Because you see, if you look at the statistics, someone that is invited to church by you, there is an 85% chance that someone will come to church that you invite compared to me as the pastor, less than 12%. That's the statistics. Listen to that. So Lynn understands what it means to invite and how to invite someone to church. There's an 85% chance that the person she invites would come to church compared to that same person, me inviting, less than 12%. You know why? Because they look at me and say, that's your job. When you invite, they look at you and say, Diane must think there is something there that's going to benefit me. She's excited about her church. She's excited about Jesus Christ. She knows and says there's something going on there that will benefit me. I think I'll investigate. For me, oh, it's your job. You're just trying to grow the numbers. You're just trying to build that the money comes in and I'm telling you there's a lot of pastors that numbers is due to money and that's that's up to them and they have to hold accountable to that Um, I would love for our church to grow for the sake of the kingdom when the church grows by lay witnessing what God does is this he brings in people to benefit the body of Christ There are gifts and graces that we may not have yet in this body that God will use as people come in for ministry, for outreach, for growth, for music, for preaching, for leadership, you name it. Children's ministry, youth ministry, adult ministry, young adult ministry, senior adult. God tends to bring, as lay witnessing happens, those into the church to benefit, actually, not just benefit, but for his purpose for growing the body of Christ. So, we're going to look at some principles next week, continue to look at some principles of what it means for you to be bought into evangelism, sharing your faith as a way of life. Because if you don't buy into it as this is a way of life that I need to lead, that I need to live daily, you remember take up your cross daily and follow me, if, if you don't buy into that, then there's really nothing that I can do. I can share a lot of principles with you, but you're not going to do it if it's not a way of life. And people will be able to pick up on that, whether it's Okay, point number one. Uh, what did they say for me to say? Oh, oh yeah. Point number two. No, you need to learn what it means to be as a way of life to share your faith. Faith sharing for Christ. So, the last thing I want to say for today before I'll, you can answer, ask some questions is this. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot faith share. It's just that simple. 
Someone that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ cannot share their faith. You can share something, but it's not your faith. You have to have that relationship to be able to share. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is the peace that is missing if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit that will lead you and guide you in faith sharing. In fact, the Holy Spirit, and, and I would say, and I'm, I didn't tell her I would want to make an example out of her, but Sandra Pierce raised her hand a while ago when I asked the question, has anyone led someone to Christ? I would dare say, and she can say I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure, almost 100% sure I'm right, that God led her to that person. In other words, we've had conversation uh, enough between the two of us that she has said, I know when God is telling me to go to someone or speak to someone. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So you say, and, and again, I'm not belittling, I'm not trying to embarrass anyone. If you've never led anyone to Christ, let God start doing that work. Start learning on how God can do that. And what will happen is you will grow in the confidence in the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you. And not only that, it's going to give you the words to say. And so it's scriptural. I'll, I can find it for you. I promise you. The scripture says God will give you the words. There's an address for that. So... Don't be apprehensive about, oh my goodness, Marty's. No. Just live into it. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God wants to use you to share his son's story with somebody. It's not just my job. It's all of our jobs to be witnesses for Jesus Christ and to help people understand the greatest gift that was ever given to the entire world. And that is Jesus. So we have five minutes because I have session shortly. Um, but we have five minutes and we'll pick up next week on a couple of more uh, biblical principles as we get into it. And then uh, we will actually the following week, Bruce is going to talk about what it means to have a relationship. Uh, what does friendships these relationships mean when it comes to witnessing and that's important we need to understand what a relationship is so questions or thoughts or comments or um, I won't see you next week I'm done or what I mean it's whatever you want to say I think for me up till now um, my intention ha hasn't been okay. There's a new friend I'm going to make, and, and I'm going to wait for a way to bring, you know, bring the subject up and bring him to Christ. Um, it hasn't been that intentional, but at least in you know the place where I worship, the place where I hear the, the word preached in my car, I try to listen to the, as much of the preaching and the music that that fills my head up with the words that I would say, that has really helped me to be ready, to just be able to just say, you know, are you a Christian or do you pray? Because I'm telling somebody something and I need them to understand the context in which I'm saying it. And um, most of the time when I've said that to somebody, they have said, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then voila, you have a new Christian friend that you didn't know you had. But asking that question was really um a process to get there, to be mm -hmm. be free enough in my spirit to say it, and not worry about somebody saying, "Well, no, I'm not a Christian," and having some kind of reaction to, "Oh, okay, well, just so you know where I'm coming from, I believe this and this and this, and I know this is going to happen." But you know how you know that conversation goes, and then the seed is planted. You know, if it germinates in my presence, it does. If it doesn't, you're on. And, and please hear me. I'm 
Bruce nor myself are going to ask you to go out and knock on doors. No. So, okay, and we're not asking you to go out and beat somebody over the head with the Bible and say the first word out of your mouth, if you die tonight, do you know you're going to heaven? Yeah. I mean, that, that's that been there and done that. Thank you, Joy. Uh, I've been there and done that too. Um, what we want to do is help you have a faith-sharing way of life. So that when the Holy Spirit prompts you, pricks you, nudges you with that point and says, this is the one that I want you to approach, or this is the one I want you to befriend. And you remember friends, acquaint friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. That will all play into this as we move forward so that you are confident in the fact that God will use you in some way for his benefit. And so don't be apprehensive or scared or anything, you know, worried about what either one of us is going to make or ask you to do. Just live into learning and having an understanding and then see what God does with that. See how God uses you with that knowledge that maybe you will gain over the next few weeks um, so that you will be a part of growing the body of Christ when it comes to believers. This is a lost world, and ultimately we know that this world is going to fail, and it's going to take the return of Jesus Christ to make things right. We know that. And I get infuriated when someone looks at me and says, well, if the world is going to hell in a handbag and it's going to be destroyed anyway, what difference does it make? Why in the world would I make a difference? And I just have to go back is what God said to. And he didn't just say it to me. He said it to all of you. And so this is his plan. And he said, I came that not anyone would be lost. Do we know that everyone's going to be saved? Not everyone's going to be saved. In fact, the gate is wide for that that leads to destruction and doom. And narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. But what if, what if God wanted to use you to make that one help lead them by his prompting? He's the one that does the saving. We just do the communicating to make it through that gate that's kind of small and narrow. How awesome is that, that God wants to use us for his purpose? So I'm going to stop there, and I thank you all for being here this morning, and I hope that something uh, in the class at least prompted you to come back and want to learn more uh, as we go through. And I promise we won't be here this time next year doing it, but I will promise that we will take it enough so that uh, we are not going to rush through it. One of the things that Bruce and I have talked about, and we've actually mentioned um, in session meeting, um, is the idea is once this course, this class is done, actually coming back and helping you to understand your gift so that you know how to use that gift in the building of the body of Christ. Because every one of us have either a gift or multiple gifts, and every gift that's given to a believer is for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And so what would happen if you know your gift, if Becky knows her gift, and she begins to use that gift to build the body of Christ in ways that God is calling her to do that she hasn't done before? You think that would benefit Hope Church in some way, the kingdom in some way? It would actually bless her because she's now using that gift. I'm not saying you're not, darling, but... Um, just an example. So um, we we may and probably will explore that as far as down the road of that would be a follow up uh, at some point in time. So, okay, uh, Mr. Elder Joiner, stand up and pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for being in your house to worship you. We thank you for the wonderful opportunities that we have each day to share you with other people that we come into contact with when we meet. And Lord, as we work with our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, and our acquaintances, 
May you, <coughs> your light shine through all of us, and may we be a certain witness for you. <coughs> be with us now as we go. Bless all those, Lord, as they travel. Bless the session as we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. So have a safe day. Those of you on session, about five or six minutes.